Uh, we're just at the beginning point of a new sermon series called Adulting 101, Lessons and Responsibility from 1 Timothy. And uh, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 1, that's where we're going to be this morning. So grab a Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and go ahead and kind of set up shop there. That's where we're going to be spending our time uh, today. If you need a Bible, if you don't have one with you, look in the row in front of you and beneath the seat, you'll find a Bible down there. Pull that Bible out. You can use it for the day. Give it to a friend. Uh, we just want to know that Bible is being used. So be sure to, to grab that out and open it up to 1 Timothy. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump in and press forward, okay? Lord, we love you with all of our heart, and we are delighted uh, to be able to be here this morning. We are especially delighted in your word. We know that it's true, and we know that we should rest our confidence in it. And so, Lord, it always challenges us. It always pushes us to take a step and to be more like you. And so, Lord, we just pray uh, that today as we look at your word, uh, you'll help us to get that and to be able to understand what you would say to us. So grant us clarity, grant us uh, freedom from distraction, help us to be able to focus for the next few minutes. We love you, we pray all this in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, if you've been paying attention to the news at all over the last few weeks, I promise you, you've seen this news story about uh, Michael Rotondo. Have you all seen this? Okay, Michael's kind of become the poster child of the adult child failure to launch kind of deal, okay? So he's 30 years old, and a while back, he loses his job. He moves back in uh, with his parents. They live just outside of Syracuse, New York, and Michael just really kind of sets up shop, okay? He has no interest in getting a job, getting out of his parents' home, anything like this. And so the parents kind of get a little tired of him uh, being around. Actually, they get a lot tired of him being around. And uh, as the months drag on, they try a number of different strategies to get Michael to, to go, right? To, to leave the nest, fly, bird, fly. And um, everything they try just doesn't seem to work. So they decide we're just not going to feed him anymore. You know, stray cat approach, right? If we don't feed him, he'll go away. And so they stop feeding him. Doesn't work, okay? Doesn't work. He manages to muster up his own food, and I guess he's got some granola bars or something, I don't know. But he hangs on. So they cut him off the family phone plan. That doesn't shake him loose either. So in February, they send him a letter, okay, very official. They send him a letter, and they uh, included in the envelopes $1,100, okay? And they basically say, go find another place to stay. And the last line of the letter was, there are jobs available even for those with a poor work history like you. Get one. You have to work, okay? But the letter didn't work. He, he did take, if you're wondering, he took the 1100 bucks, but he didn't move out. Thanks for the cash, Mom and Dad, okay? Um, finally, Mom and Dad have had all they can take. Mark and Christina finally were fed up. And so they actually had him evicted. They took him to court, and they had him evicted, and he contested the eviction, okay? And so on May 23rd, all this kind of comes to a head. The local judge says, are you kidding me? You're out of there, and gave him just a couple of days to evict and he moved out on Friday. He loaded up his shaky station wagon uh, with all of his stuff, and he drove away. Now, he did a couple of interviews. He kind of had his 15 minutes of fame because of this news story. It generated a little bit of cash. And so when asked what he was going to do when he left, he said, I'm going to take a well-deserved uh, vacation. <laughs> and so he's on vacation apparently right now. And then uh, after vacation, he plans to move in with his cousin. So, Yeah. Now, think about, do y'all ever read the comment sections on news stories, or is it only me? <laughs> think about those comment sections. How many of y'all think they are trending in Michael's favor at all? Anybody? <laughs> if you think that, you've never read a comment section ever, ever, ever in your life, and you're incredibly naive, okay? People have been lighting this guy up. Are you surprised by that? If he's waiting for public opinion to turn... Uh, it's not going to happen. Now, as I followed this story, though, um, what was of interest to me was not so much his failure to launch and all of that. I could not help, and maybe it's because I have today on my mind and this text on my mind, but I could not help but think, what an incredible missed opportunity. Uh, imagine with me, if you would, 
what would have happened, what would Michael's story have been? Where would he be relationally with his parents? Can't you imagine? That's going to be a sweet Thanksgiving at that home. Where would he be if he had been in high school and said, you know what? I'm going to light it up. I'm going to absolutely maximize my potential. I'm going to go to the best university that will accept me. And he does. And he goes there and he arrives on campus. And again, he says, you know what? I'm going to light it up. I'm going to be the best student the school has ever seen. No one is going to be able to, ma- be able to match my work ethic. There will be people here that are smarter than me. I can't help that. i got so much talent. It's what God's given me. But what I've got, I'm putting to work. No one is going to be able to pace my work ethic. Nobody. And he does. And he lights it up. He graduates with honors the whole bit. He gets a job, a good job, a starter job, but a good job. And he walks into that job with the same attitude. And he says, I'm going to light it up. This person has hired me. They've entrusted me. I'm going to make them believe that's the best decision of all time. I'm going to light it up. He meets a young girl, and he says, you know what? That's going to be my wife. And I'm going to show her what it means to be married to the best husband on the planet. I'm going to win husband of the year award year after year after year. I'm going to light it up. What if he does? What if, instead of watching his life go by, what if this guy crushes his potential at every possible turn. Are we reading this story in the news? No, not at all. Every single bit of this is because he doesn't measure up to his God-given potential, every bit. And as we're doing these lessons and responsibility from 1 Timothy, this is our lesson today, okay? Here you are. A mature believer maximizes his or her god given potential. That's the step that we want to take today. Think about that statement as you just look at it there on the screen. Let it rattle around in your head for just a moment. Is it true at work? Is that statement true in your work life? Absolutely. Every employer that hires a new employee hopes that that employee will come in and absolutely maximize their God-given potential. I promise you, nobody hires a potential staff member and says, you know, I hope that this person just really mails it in. I hope that they're late to work every day, early to leave every day. You know, I hope that they prop their feet up on their desk and do their nails. That's what I am, that's what I'm looking for. No employer ever thinks that. Every employer thinks if this person comes in here and they're a game changer, if they work really hard, it could change the trajectory of this organization, right? That's what they're hoping and thinking, all right? What about at home? Is that true at home? I cannot tell you how many times I've sat down with couples and had the wife look at me and say, you know, when I married him, I just thought he was going to grow up. And he never did. He never did. I married a boy. I'm still married to a boy. I would just like to be married to a man. That'd be great. That'd be great. You think she wants her husband to measure up to his God given potential. What about here at church? I found it amazingly providential that this text was on deck on the day that we were going to celebrate the results for Focus 2020. Both of these events were planned a long time ago. Honestly, you all, I'm not smart enough to put all this together. What happens, as we've just been saying, what happens if all those steps that people said, yes, I'm going to take that step, what happens if we crush it? What happens if we all live up to our God-given potential? It's huge. Conversely, what happens if we don't? It's tragedy, isn't it? It's heartbreak, isn't it? It's missed opportunity, one after the other after the other. See, reaching our potential, our full potential, our God-given potential, is not just about trying harder. It's not about just, I'm just going to roll my sleeves up another turn and working a little harder. To pull this off, It's a full-blown partnership with the Holy Spirit of God himself, isn't it? I've got to say, you know what? I'm going to follow where God leads me. I'm going to invest in what God tells me to invest in. I'm going to go all out into the areas that God has gifted me and equipped me and called me. 
And this is exactly what Timothy is going to learn about today. Uh, the letter of 1 Timothy, what we're going to be uh, looking at, if you've been here for the last couple of weeks, you know that it's a letter from a senior statesman in the church, a guy named Paul, to a young upstart in the church, a guy named Timothy. And Timothy's been given an insanely difficult assignment. He's been dropped off at a church in a town called Ephesus, and this church is dysfunctional beyond belief. Namely, there's false teaching that's crept in. People that are trusted leaders have blown it. They've not lived up to their potential. And because of it, this church is awash in false teaching, and there's a real risk that this church may go completely under. And so Paul writes to Timothy, says, Timothy, here's your mission. Here's what you got to do. And in our portion of 1 Timothy today, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul writes Timothy and encourages him to reach his maximum potential as a Christ follower and a leader in spite of everything, all the obstacles that are in front of him. So let's look at verse 18. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you so that by them you may strongly engage in battle, having faith and a good conscience. Now take a look at that verse, let it roll around inside of your brain for a little moment, and here is what Paul is saying to Timothy. He's saying, listen, Timothy, in no uncertain terms, I want you to reach your full potential as you engage in this battle to wrest this church from the hands of false teachers. Don't you love it when someone says to you, hey, I got a job for you, and by the way, it's an all-out war. Nothing is going to be easy here. This is going to be a battle. This is going to be a slugfest. You want to do this? Sound fun? Man, nobody likes hearing that. And that's exactly what Paul says. It's going to be an incredible battle. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, if you're going to succeed in this battle, there's a couple of things you've got to get right. The first thing you've got to get right is you've got to live up to your billing. And the second thing you've got to get right is you've got to do it with your faith and your conscience all still intact, okay? Now, what's that first one mean? It's kind of weird for us. We look at this verse, and it says, I want you to live up in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you. We don't talk that way anymore. So what does he mean there? What does he mean when he says, the prophecies made about you? Uh, well, when I was a, a teenager, there was a fellow, a friend of mine in the same church in high school with me, and uh, he and I both were called into the ministry at almost the exact same time. So here's this little county seat church in Tennessee uh, with these two high school kids who both say, hey, God's calling me into the ministry at the same time, two 17-year-old kids. And uh, so we both uh, you know, follow through, and we graduate from high school. We go off to separate universities and kind of lose contact with each other. He goes to seminary in one place. I go to seminary in another. I go into missions, and he goes into local church work. And every time I would see his dad, okay, I'd go back to my hometown, go back to my home church, and I would see his dad. His dad would pull me aside, and he would just be beaming with pride. He said, David, let me tell you about Ed and his progress. And he told me, Ed went off to college, and he won some departmental awards. Everybody knew that Ed was going to be great. And they went on to seminary, and Ed crushed it in seminary. And then he got this amazing job with this incredible church. Lots of churches wanted Ed, but he took this job. And now he's working for the denomination. He's writing material and writing curriculum. And David, Ed gets these job offers all the time. People love Ed. Have you ever heard parents like that before, right? Hey, my son can play soccer like nobody's business. My kid, he can, he can work magic with a baseball, right? Or my child has a 14.0 GPA. I don't know how they pull this off. It used to only be four. But they've tricked the math. It's new math. And my kid, wow, you should watch them do algebra. It's smoking, right? Y'all met those parents before? All right, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, Timothy, when you were a kid, when you were a young man, everybody was saying, you're not going to believe what this guy's going to be like in the future. They were prophesying about where you were going to be and what you were going to do and what kind of person you were going to be. And Timothy, if you're going to succeed, you've got to maximize your potential. You've got to live up to the billing. You've got all these people that you've got to make proud. 
Is there pressure there at all, y'all? You'd better believe it. You know, when I was a kid, y'all know my parents both died when I was really young. And going through high school, one of the things that kind of kept me going and helped keep me more or less on track was the reality that I would often think, I want my parents to be proud of me. I don't want to let that go by. And just because they're not here doesn't mean I don't want to make them proud. Paul puts that pressure on Timothy. He says, you want to maximize your potential? Make sure that you're living in such a way that makes all those people who said all those good things, who predicted that you were going to be great, you do them proud. And then he says, and you've got to do all that with a good faith and with a clean conscience. Isn't that huge? You've got to follow through, be who you are, and you've got to do it the right way. And I know it's going to be a battle, and I know it's going to be a war, but you've got to follow through because people are counting on you. And some of you are in that very spot right now. People are counting on you. And the stakes are sky high. And just not hurting anybody, that's not good enough, is it? That doesn't get it done. What gets it done is maximizing your potential as a leader, a father, a mother, a boss, an employee, whatever it can be. And you can feel that pressure. So let me add a little bit more pressure while you're feeling it. What about your church? Your church needs you to maximize your potential as a believer. That's what we've been talking about earlier today, right? We need you to maximize your potential as a disciple, as a servant and stuff. Uh, We need it to happen because this church is a different place if you maximize your potential. What am I talking about? I'm talking about finding that place that God has just really kind of planted in your heart and then going for it. Over the last few weeks, I've I've just teased you a little bit by talking about a mentoring program for uh, kids who are going through the juvenile system in the Second Circuit. We're working to develop this in cooperation with the, the Second Circuit. That's the court here in our area. And we're going to be providing mentors for these young kids. They've discovered that if they can provide them with mentors early on, very often they don't wind up being repeat offenders. It is game-changing. Every time I mention it, some of you all will come to me and you'll say, hey, that mentoring thing that you mentioned, I want to be a part of that. God's placed this call. For others of you, it's children's ministry here at church. For others of you, it's student ministry. For others of you, it's something else. For others of you, it's evangelism. For some of you, it's missions, right? What if you found that burn that God has placed in your heart here in our church? And what if, what if you crushed it? What if you maximized your potential in that area? Wow. Do you think our church would be a different place if everybody did the same thing? Oh, you bet. That's what happens. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, If you're going to see this church turn around and go from what it is, maybe it's on a trajectory to even go out of business, if you're going to be a part of turning that around, you've got to live up to the billing. You've got to maximize it, and you've got to do it with a good faith and a good conscience, okay? And now, why does he put all this pressure on him? And the reason he does is because there have been some key leaders in this church, and they have been absolutely mailing it in. They haven't hit their full potential. In fact, quite to the opposite. Look at what he says in verse 19. Some have rejected these, meaning these two steps that I've been talking to you to take, right? Some have rejected these and have suffered the shipwreck of their faith. Wow, look at that. Isn't that descriptive and powerful? Verse 20, he gives us an example. Hymenaeus and Alexander are among them. And then look at this next line. This is killer. I have delivered them to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. What? Now, that last line just gets our attention. I know if you're like me at all, you're so distracted by that last line that you've already forgotten what he said in verse 19. You've just blown right by that, right? So I figure we got to deal with that first so we can come back and, and discuss the other. So what in the world is Paul talking about when he says that he's delivered them to Satan? What is going on? We got devil worship happening. Uh, what's going on here? No, none of that at all. What he's saying here is that we're kicking these guys completely out of the church. 
They're not in the fellowship anymore. They are out there in the world. And you say, well, how, what does that mean then? He's handed them over to Satan. I don't get that connection. You all, know, church is a pretty amazing place. Have you all noticed that when you come to church, it operates on a different paradigm than your office operates on? I mean, you come in here, and I hope that while you're here you know, on, you know, at celebration, you're not hearing all kinds of profanity and bad language and that kind of stuff. I would hope it's kind of a free... It's, some, it's like people know. They may cuss like sailors on Monday, but here on church on Sunday, it is sanctified, right? You know what I'm talking about, okay? You're driving through the parking lot in your monster truck, and a Prius backs out in front of you. That happens at Walmart, you just run right over the Prius. But here at church, what do you do? Oh, <laughs> please, please back out in front of me. You do me honor by giving you the opportunity to serve you this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you, right? <laughs> what is going on? Are people just pretending? No, it's being here and being around you all, this collective identity that we have as the saints of God. It brings out the best in us, doesn't it? Paul says no more of that for them. Out they go. They're just going to have to take their chances out there. And by the way, this is biblical. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 18. He says, hey, it may come to it. You just have to tell somebody. They just can't be among believers anymore. And the purpose of this isn't to be punitive. The purpose of this is to be redemptive. The hope is they're going to miss this. They're going to want to come back to this. And so maybe, maybe God will get their attention and that's what we're going to do. So that's what he means when he says we're going to uh, hand them over, or deliver them over to Satan. That's what he's talking about, okay? And this seems harsh to us, but it doesn't seem harsh to Paul. It doesn't seem harsh to Jesus when he talks about Matthew 18 because they realize just how serious sin really is and how bad it is when people refuse to live up to their God-given potential. And so... Paul says to Timothy, you've got to realize your potential as a believer in Jesus Christ. People have been counting on you from the very beginning. They've been lifting you up as an example your entire life. And so you've got to follow through on this thing with a good faith and a good conscience because there are some in this church who've done a huge face plant on this thing. They have wrecked it. And we've had to kick them out of the church, and it's sad because they had potential but instead of realizing that potential, they have shipwrecked their faith. That's what Paul says. So I want to ask you, as I'm working on this, one question just rose to the top for me. And it was this. Are you realizing your full potential as a believer? And you know, I'm typing away, right, getting ready for today. I'm typing away, and I type those words on the screen. And I looked at it, and I had to do a real gut check myself. Now, what do I say with any measure of integrity as I stand up and challenge people to ask themselves that question? Are you realizing your full potential as a believer of Jesus Christ? I had to say, well, how am I doing? Am I living as a mature follower of Jesus? Because... Whether I like it or not, whether I know it or not, the stakes are sky high. And the stakes are sky high for you as well, whether you know it or whether you don't. And some of you are really struggling at home right now in your marriage. And it's not because you're doing stuff that's bad. It's because you've been mailing it in maybe for years and you're refusing to hit your God-given potential as a husband or as a wife. And for some of you, it's with your kids. And you see the trajectory they're on, <laughs> they're only that tall. And for some reason, even though it hits you, you know, yeah, probably should get on that, you don't realize how high the stakes are. And so you just keep mailing it in. And for some of you, it's as an employee. And you're working away in your job, and you're doing okay. You're getting reasonable reviews. 
Everybody seems to be more or less happy, but you're mailing it in, and you know it. You're not at all fulfilling your God-given potential. And the stakes are sky high. And for some of you, it's in your walk with Christ in how that's lived out here in this church here at Celebration. And you've been mailing it in. And you know it, right? This is something that you do every now and then because you want to. It isn't something that you see as mission critical. And you have no concept of how huge the stakes are because you're not hitting your God-given potential and you're not enjoying the impact that God has created you to enjoy, right? Wow, the stakes are high. You see the connection? What if, what if over the next two years, what if we crush it? What if we as a body, us as a collected individuals, here we all are, what if we crush it? What if we see the God-given potential for this body realized because it's realized in each one of us? Imagine where this thing goes. Imagine where it goes. Father, we thank you very much for this day, for the chance to look into your word. Just a couple of short verses. What an incredible challenge. Lord, everybody in here has at some point in their life just sort of mailed it in, you know, half effort, if half. And we don't really appreciate the stakes. We don't see the opportunity cost in that decision. So we just sort of sleepwalk. And so, Lord, we just pray that just like Paul did with Timothy, you shake us up a little bit right now. Just, it's okay. It's okay to get shaken up a little bit. And for us to have to confront those areas in our life where, truth be told, we know we're mailing it in. Maybe it's at work, maybe it's at home, at school. Maybe it's here in this body. And we just fail to grasp the cost of loafing through life and not hitting our potential. But Lord, you have created us, you have planted us into this life at this time for such a time as this. And you've given us influence. And if we will hit our potential, man, the sky's the limit. It would be unbelievable what could happen in our home, at work, at school, in our church. So Lord, fire us up. Wake that passion within us. Light that fire so that we will live like it matters and live for you like it counts. We pray this in the great name of Jesus Christ. And everyone agreed and said, Amen. Amen.